What's up everybody? Welcome back to Polygon Academy. My name is Tim and uh, this is episode 3 of the Game Dev Q&A series. This episode is actually a super special episode because not only is it me answering your questions, but I also brought along my best friend and assistant art director Lincoln Hughes to get in uh, on the action as well. So you'll get a double dose of knowledge in this episode and we really go deep on a lot of your guys' questions on art and the industry. So much so in fact that again this is going to be a two-parter. Uh, part two is going to drop tomorrow. Um, I'm going to get both episodes out for you right away uh, because there's a ton of value to be had in all these questions and I know that you guys are really going to enjoy it. In this episode, we're going to dive into some topics like uh, should you play the games of the studios you're interviewing at? Uh, how would we go about breaking into the industry if we had zero money ourselves? Some of the key differences between working alone and actually working in a studio or on a game dev team. Uh, I know a lot of students, they sometimes feel that like their, their life might be a lot different if they're actually working on a game dev team. Uh, so we're going to dive into that. We're also going to go into how to avoid plateauing as an artist. Uh, this is a common problem that affects a lot of people both in the industry as well as students trying to break in. And finally, we go into some key skills you should probably develop if you eventually one day want to become an art director like Lincoln in the game industry. So before we dive into the Q&A session, make sure you smash that like button to say thank you to Lincoln. Uh, his time is really valuable and I really do appreciate him sitting down with me to go over your guys' questions. Drop him a little comment below just saying, hey, thanks, uh, or you know, maybe ask him some questions. He's going to be diving in and out of the, the comment section and interacting with you guys as well. As well as make sure you're subscribed with the notification bell turned on. Uh, so when I drop the part two tomorrow, uh, it'll pop up right in your feed as well as future videos. So without further ado, let's just dive right into this game dev Q&A session. <laughs> Bam, let's do that. <sighs> All right, so uh, before we get started, um, this is my best buddy in the world, Lincoln. Uh, he's an art director at Two Games. Welcome to Link. We've got some whiskey, and we're going to be doing you guys' questions tonight. So uh, before we dive right into it, uh, you want to give a two-minute introduction about yourself? Two minutes. Fuck. Quick, too long. quick, let's get All into right. it. Uh, I've been in the game industry for about... I don't know, 13, 14 years. Uh, my name is Lincoln Hughes. Uh, I'm assistant art director at Took Games with uh, this guy currently. And I've worked at a bunch of different studios, namely uh, Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, uh, Warner Brothers, Next Level Games, Relic. There's like five or six of them. All over the place, eh? Yeah. 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 Like uh, notable titles, Watch Dogs 2, Watch Dogs 1, Far Cry 4, uh, Luigi's Mansion, Ghost Recon, uh, Need for Speed, SSX, SSX, uh, Star Wars, Star Wars, Republic. Old Republic, SOCOM, <laughs> it, the list goes on. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. Uh, and your background, you went to art school, right? Yeah, I went to uh, the Art Institute of Burnaby, like right outside of Vancouver. Uh, it's a year and a half long course. Um, yeah. Cool. So yeah, as a, I, like as most of you guys know, I'm self taught. He went to art school, so you will have a pretty balanced perspective, I think, for a lot so of you guys' questions. What he's actually saying is there's going to be a few headbutts throughout uh, the debate between me and uh, most Kenny likely over here, as the as the booze flows, as the, the booze flows like the salmon of Capistrano. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's dive into it. All right, so this first question comes from Taylor on uh, Twitter. He says, when applying for a job at a game studio. Would it reflect on you poorly to admit to not having played previous titles from that studio? Sometimes I like a company's art style more than their games. Run with it, man. You, t you take this first one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've actually been in that situation about 10 times. Um, and I don't know. I, I think like the more research that you have on the studio that you're interviewing for and the more information you have on the art style, like... Anything that can show to the interviewer that like you're really interested in the making, the making of the game is uh, basically gonna help you get a job. So do you know what? If you're a junior and you really, really want a job, like yeah, go grab uh, one of their games and play it. Yeah, Force you can probably find one of their previous titles for like twenty yeah. bucks, right? Like yeah. chances are, if it's a, a bigger studio, they've had multiple games come out in the past. Yeah, and spending that twenty dollars to thirty dollars to go buy one of their games, even if you're like dead broke, is probably a good investment because then you'll actually have more context set up for the interview, right? So it's a small yeah. like investment. Uh, it's probably good to want to actually play the games you want to work on. Uh, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, totally. Like I, I don't know. I, do you know what? Like I, there's, there's, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. There's a ton of people in the game industry that don't actually like enjoy 
playing the games that they're actually working on. And, you know, they really enjoy working on them and they like the art in them. And, you know, there's a bunch of things that they admire about the game, but they might not enjoy playing the game. You know, like for me, I actually have a hard time even playing the games that I work on in general. Because, afterwards, especially afterwards. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because, I'm, I'm actually the opposite. I'll, I'll pick them up and I'll do a, a full fresh playthrough just to be like, <laughs> yeah, this was so fun working on this. Like we both worked on Space Marine. And I think after the fact, like I played through it multiple times because I actually I enjoyed the game. Um, long story short, I think there's a certain thing of like the games that you're going to work on, you probably like for me, I don't actually think I would really want to work on like Uncharted or God of War or like Skyrim or something like that, because I actually want to get that experience like completely fresh out the gate. Right. Yeah. You're what, what you're saying though, you're not saying that you wouldn't want to work on it. You're saying that like, I love the game so much that like, I, I don't want to spoil the experience by knowing what actually happens in it. Yeah, right? yeah, and sure. like I, I totally empathize with that because like a ton of the games that I've worked on, I'm just like, oh, like I can't even play them because I, I know the story, yeah, yeah, I yeah. know the you, art, you know I know where all everything. the collectibles are. And yeah, 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 it's, exactly. It's yeah, so but yeah, it, for the, for going in, in, if you have like an interview at a studio, spend the twenty thirty bucks, grab one of their older games, and uh, at least have a little bit more context to bring to the table. Because yeah. I mean, it, it really is a small investment. And you'll appear like you're really, you know, you're a lot more passionate about that actual studio and their games. If you, if you can, or even just watch like a Let's Play. Like that's, that's another thing that's out there oh, yeah. nowadays. Like if you actually don't want to go, if, if you don't even have the $30 to spend or something, for some people, they're super broke, right? They're a student. Just go watch a Let's Play. Just get more context for their games and, uh, and the kind of content that the studio is producing. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this next question comes from uh, Jack Chatterton on Twitter. He says, uh, hey, Tim. What's your advice to someone without much money applying to a job that would require them to relocate? Do companies assist with this or would they need to fund the move themselves? Any stories from others who are in a similar situation? Thanks. Uh, This is a great question. Actually, me and Lincoln, we both used to work together in Vancouver and we relocated at the same time to Ubisoft Montreal. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, the studio, they paid for our move, right? They packed up all of our stuff. We were actually roommates at the time. Uh, so they packed up all of our stuff, moved us across country, hooked us up with apartments for the first month. I, I kind of covered this in the last video. Um, but yeah, you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would say like if, if you're a junior artist or junior anything, um, I think you're going to find it a lot harder to be able to get a company to relocate you. That's a good uh, point. Yeah, because like if you're like a senior, like mid-level, like yeah, they... You know, it's it's a it's a bigger investment for the company to actually make, uh, and you know, it's just one of the unfortunate things about being a junior. Um, but I I don't know. I I think that's if, if I yeah if, <laughs> I don't know if, what else if, to say. If, if a company is gonna give you a job offer and think about relocating you, they'll usually pay for the relocation. Uh, but it is yeah, it is harder for juniors to get relocated sometimes, um, for the most part. But I think. You could also, I mean, you could just bite the bullet and move to a game dev hub. Like, yeah. it, like if I was in Vancouver, I would consider moving to Montreal if I was oh, a totally. student. Yeah, like I, I actually, a friend of mine uh, is, uh, he's a junior. He's like trying to break into the game industry and he's in Brazil. And, uh, you know, he, he's having a hard time uh, getting people to relocate him uh, with all the companies that he's applying at. And I basically, I just told him like, dude, like move to Montreal. Like come out here like figure out a way to get here if your portfolio is solid and you're actually in the city that you're applying to the companies in uh then you know like you're gonna find a job it's just like the yeah. probably like one of the main things that's act- actually holding you back from getting a job at that point is your the location. fact that you're so far away and the investment in the investment for the company is actually way bigger for you because you're just a junior at that point right so yeah, so like if I mean if if you're like say in Vancouver working at McDonald's trying to get into the game industry, I mean worst case scenario you can move to Montreal and work at McDonald's still, right? Like, yeah, it's uh, so I, I mean, yeah, just set yourself up for success. But like if yeah if you're in talks with a company and they they're gonna give you a job offer, if they're anything but the smallest of companies, yeah, they'll usually pay for your relocation. Um, because I kind of covered this question in the last video. Uh, I was going to put a bit of a spin on it, and if you had like zero money, how would you go about getting into the game industry? What would, like what would be your advice if you're completely broke and you're like, I want to get a job in the in the game studio in the next like two three years? What would you do? 
I don't know. I, I think like that question is going to vary from person to person because like some people like they think they want to get in the game industry, but like, you know, they're not like a thousand percent passionate about it, you know? And then sometimes there's other people that are like, I know that that's what I want. That's my life goal. I know that I want to be an artist doing that. And that's that. Right. So depending on which one of those two you are, uh, you know, the answer is going to vary. So if, if you're one of those artists that like knows that it's exactly what you want to do, then bite the bullet, like go work the crappiest job possible for the most amount of money that you possibly can save up, survive basically. It's not for the faint of heart. Like if you, if your heart isn't like a thousand percent in it and you know, you're like kind of half-assing it, you're not working like on the side and, and really getting better and you're seeing the improvement on a daily basis, maybe that isn't the best thing for you. I, I don't know. Like if, if you have no money and you really want to get in, like it's your output really right? yeah like, yeah like you have to have exactly. the passion for yeah. it like so my, my advice would be very similar it would, be, it would be to get the job that you have to work the least amount of time to make the most money, amount of money possible so like maybe you know like uh, a night shift job where you're making like 10 15 bucks an hour depending on where the minimum wage is but you can actually be like you know on your phone reading about or watching 3d tutorials while you're at work like you know like oh, yeah. a, a security desk job or something like that and then I would devote all of my spare time into developing that skill set. But I would also, you know, I would have a job so I was able to purchase like tutorials or, you know, ways of, of funding. Oh, maybe you need to subscribe to Substance Designer. So that's like 20 bucks a month. So you have to have some form of income. I think a lot of people, they go in with the mindset of like, I don't want to, I, I can't have a job because that's going to take all my time. But I mean, a lot of the reality is you do need some form of income to sustain yourself, oh, right? Yeah. Like I worked in a baby store. <laughs> when I was on my way, like that's the most like humiliating thing ever. I worked in a baby store, but I needed that income, right? So it is, it is super important to have that, uh, some t type of cash flow. I mean, that'll teach you just life things in general, like managing your finances, but that'll give you some income. You can either devote towards software or tutorials that'll help you build your skill set faster and hopefully get you out of that situation. But I think there is no, there is no, like, I have no money, but I don't want to work any job. Like that's a very naive kind of thing, right? Like yeah. that a lot of younger people I think have. They're like, I don't want to have a job. I, I want to get a job in the industry, but I don't have any money to put into software tutorials or any way of investing in myself in any way, shape or form. I, I think like, you know, it, like right now there's like 20 different companies and 20 different types of software that you can actually subscribe to on like a monthly basis, right? And man, that, that money like adds up, like even oh, me, yeah. like it's like every month I, uh, you know, I probably have like 150 bucks of like different software that I'm investing in on a monthly basis and, uh, cut you know, your Netflix, yeah. <laughs> well, that'll, well, that'll increase your output and your you money. Netflix, yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but I don't know. I, I think like you have to, if you don't have money, you're really, really going to need to like, you know, specialize yourself. Okay. Well, like I'm going to demonstrate to an employer that I'm amazing at substance painter. Right. So then like designer or yeah, like yeah, modeling yeah. Or one of the programs specialize in them. For yeah. And I mean, there's also plenty of free software out there. Like, you know, blender, if you really want to learn the skills of modeling, like you can start with blender, right? Like eventually you'll probably need to know Max or Maya to get a job in a studio, but modeling skills are modeling skills. Like the tools can be interchangeable, yeah, right? Yeah. Like if you know about proper like edge flow, uh, if you're being a character artist, maybe, you know, proper topology for like a character's face, like that's totally independent from software. Yeah. So there's totally a lot of free, free alternatives out there that you could also use to build your skill set, And then maybe, you know, spend a couple months investing in like a, well, even Max has a, a student subscription that you can use for free. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. th that also makes kind of that irrelevant as well. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, spend your time using what you can afford and then maybe spend two or three months using paid software again, having a job to be able to pay for that, right? So, yeah, yeah. I think that's that pretty much covers it. You're going to need some form of income, but have, like, the least amount of time spent at, like, a crappy job so you can have most of your time spent developing your actual skill sets that are going to pay off in the long run. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that sounds like an impossible thing, too. Oh, you know, this crappy job, yeah, you're probably going to be working it a lot, um, and you might not have enough spare time. Patience. It's, it's going to take yeah. a couple years. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the game industry. You yeah. know, like how it, long did it take you to get good to get into the game industry? I started 3d modeling on Maya when I was 10. 
<laughs> okay. And you got into the industry at what? 19. Okay. Nine years. Yeah. I was about six years. So yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it's, it's the long game, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that you need that much experience to be able to actually do it. Like, you know, there's some people, they pick it up like immediately. Um, but you know, still two or three years probably. Yeah. I think like, yeah. and you know, back then it was kind of different. There wasn't nearly the amount of training resources that there are today. Like now exactly. it's like, you can it, totally shortcut your learning curve. Oh yeah. Right? Like accessibility like, is just like a billion times what it was. Like yeah. Even, years even ago, YouTube you know? wasn't, it, it like, isn't, uh, is, is way better than what it was like 10 years oh, yeah. ago. So it's, uh, yeah. Use as many free resources as you can and then maybe like invest a bit of money in developing your skill set. But yeah. Long story short, you're probably going to need some form of job or income. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this next question comes from a X Axel explosion explosion. Axel plosion. Axel plosion. <laughs> uh, I'm a self-taught beginner and mostly work alone or with my friend. What are some less obvious differences between working alone and working with a bigger team? Is it easier to keep focused on the project when you're working on it closely with other people? Take it away. I don't know. I guess it just depends on what your goals are. Like if you're working on, uh, you know, this little thing on in your apartment. Okay. That's a lot different. Like usually if, if you're working in, in a big game studio, like there's like a big project and you know, there's like 10 different departments, there's audio VFX, lighting materials, tech art, tech animators, animators, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on. Right. So, uh, sometimes, uh, those things, they can be overwhelming. Sometimes they can be amazing because, you know, interdepartmental support. Um, I don't know. It, it can be distracting uh, when there's a ton of other people around you. Um, yeah, like you can spend your day stuck in meetings and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily yeah. more productive. Uh, I think I think that the team atmosphere can be really collaborative and like help keep the motivation up because you see other cool things that people are working on. But I mean, at the same time, if you're working an eight hour day, six, six of those eight hours are usually spent with your headphones on at your desk, yeah. working on your, in your own zone kind of thing. Right. So, I mean, unless it, you're elite, unless you're elite, <laughs> then you're just in meetings all day, but, uh, or, or an art director, you're, you know, you're, you're more communicating with people, but if you're an artist, 90% of the time is going to be spent sitting at your desk with your headphones on working on whatever it is, this thing is that you're assigned to work on anyways. Yeah. So it's not that different than working on your portfolio in your basement. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you're going to maybe rely on other people to kind of keep you going, like it's not as yeah. impactful working on a team as you would think, I don't think. I think it, it really depends on the person. If you're like the type of person that like is capable of he like heavily organizing yourself and like having goals and, you know, breaking those goals into smaller goals and then like sticking yeah. to the, your guns and then getting each one of Basically, them done. Be your own producer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's to make your life easier. If, if you're capable of doing that, then yeah, by all means. If, if, if you're not, then, you know, maybe uh, having a good producer behind you will be very beneficial. Yeah. And I mean, that could be like, like you said, like sometimes you're working with your friends. I mean, you could, you could use each other to keep yourselves accountable to hitting like uh, deadlines and targets that you guys set for each other. Uh, maybe you're working on a collaborative project or not. Even if you're just both working on your own portfolios, be like, okay, let's give ourselves each a month to do like a, a scene or a character or a vehicle. And, uh, you know, we're going to break it down into here's the, you know, week one is going to be pre-production. Week two is, is modeling and texturing. Week three is like, you know, the overall scene construction and presentation. And then uh, we're both going to launch it on ArtStation at the same day. And, uh, you know, we'll help each other with the social media boost, all that kind of thing. So, I mean, yeah. you can do that regardless if you're working at a studio or by yourself as a, as a student or, uh, you know, someone who's working to develop their own portfolio if you're self-taught. Yeah. So, but I think, I think the idea, everyone does tend to have this idea of like, oh man, if I was in a studio environment, everything, I would get so much more done or way more productive. And that's almost sometimes the reverse because you just get distracted with meetings, people coming up to you at yeah. your desk, interrupting you. So the, if, of your eight hour day, you may be doing actually four to six hours of productive work, sometimes yeah. less depending on the, the phase of production. Um, so but thinking that that's going to be like a night and day difference is probably a big mistake, I would think. Yeah. Are you like, are you, are you one of those type of people, types of people that like can actually sit in their apartment for like 12 hours straight and work on something and just get shit done? Like, you know, over like the course of like a weekend? Yeah. Because if you're eventually you eventually know, want to like, be a freelancer, that's going to be a skill that you're going to be at home oh, totally. working on your own stuff too, right? And with no accountability. So developing that uh 
self-discipline actually and the the sense of consistency of just I might not even have a boss but I'm going to force myself to sit down for 5 hours a day and work on something Monday to Friday even if I'm not even if I'm not getting paid for it which is when you're when you're a student trying to yeah. break into the industry that's the hard part you're not getting paid for it and there's no like consequences other than not getting a job yeah if you don't work right yeah that like that payoff though it's like I don't know it, it's pretty rewarding when you get your first job, right? Like, but a lot of people forget about that because it yeah. seems so far off. Like, I'm not, I'm not there yet. It's going to take me so long to get a job in the industry. Like, it's easy to fall off because you're like, oh, it's going to take me three years. Like, I can play video games today. Yeah, I think, like, when you're a student and, you know, you're like, oh, you're not getting paid for it. it yeah, it sucks. And, you know, at the same time. It's, it's also like, more freeing because you can work on whatever you want. Yeah, but like if, you know, if you're working at McDonald's trying to get a job in the game industry, it's... It's tough. Know, it does suck. It, like, I'm sure that sucks. Harnessing that... Uh, Having worked at McDonald's myself, I know from personal experience. <laughs> Having that energy after a day, like the day job, uh, it, it is tough when, you, when you're not actually working in the industry. But also as well, when you're working in the, in the industry, coming home and working on your own, just try and like, you know, stay relevant or keep up with the Joneses in terms of like... Oh, there's five new softwares that came out this year. I got to learn those. Yeah. After an eight-hour day in a studio, are you going to want to go home and do that? And yeah. I think that's that's a big self-awareness thing. Is like, do you even want to do that? Like, yeah. you, don't, you don't necessarily yeah, totally. have to. I think a lot of people are like, I have to go home and work on my own personal projects on top of working in the studio. And for me, I think I for a long time I was, I for like five years I didn't do any personal work. <laughs> I just oh, I just did my studio me. work, came home, and yeah. was like, I'm going to watch movies, play video games, go have a beer with my friends. And it was fine. It didn't like really negatively impact me in any way. But yeah. then I think when I, I decided to get into the groove of doing personal work again, I almost came at it um, with more of a, a bit of passion because it was something I truly wanted to do than rather than felt that I was obligated to do it. Yeah. 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 I had basically the exact same thing. I don't know if it's something that like really, really drives you like you can seriously like you can own within like a couple years if you're smart about it. Like, yeah. If you go home, you like it, work hours and hours, and like I'm not, I'm not saying like go home, work yourself to death. Like you don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, no but sorry like, guys, disclaimer notice. Like we don't want you to kill yourself. Yeah, but I think consistency is key, right? Like a couple hours yeah. a night for a few nights a week. It doesn't even have to, you know, like a, you know, two or three nights a week. Yeah, you spend like an extra four hours after work doing something that will like yeah. actually elevate you, and you, you know, you walk away from it feeling holy shit, like, I, I really, I aced that, like, I, I got something accomplished, like, and it's not just in terms of, like, oh, I did something that I felt passionate about, it's more like, wow, I, like, I really, like, I brought myself to, like, the next level in terms of my humanity, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, it, no, it's seriously, it, it comes yeah, from you, that. you feel like, like you've accomplished something, it gives you a sense of, like, uh, self-development and self-worth, like, Wow, I can, I can, I, because I actually finished this, I can do the next task and the next task, and I'm, yeah. I'm developing my my artistic skills and you know, um, yeah, just basically progressing rather than just kind of like flatlining, right? Yeah, which I think is is a very easy groove to fall into is, is the the comfort zone and the flatline. Oh, totally. So, all right. So this next question comes from Peter Tran, and uh, we actually both work with Peter at Two. He's a lighting artist. He's a baller. Yeah, he's super talented. <laughs> Uh, he's a beast. He's a beast. Uh, I'll link to his art station down below. Go give him some love. Uh, but he's he's a really talented dude. Uh, and Peter says, "Yo, any advice on how not to plateau in the long term for junior artists in the industry?" And I think this this totally applies to any range of artists, not just juniors. But there's some very plateaued seniors out there too, right? Like it's, oh, yeah. it's very easy to plateau and, there's and some kind plateaued of plateaued directors. It's a, everybody plateaus. A hundred percent. Just apply to juniors for sure. So I, I think for me, the uh, the biggest thing you can do to to avoid plateauing is to always slightly be uncomfortable with what you're doing. Um, to push yourself outside of your comfort zone because I've said it before, like that's usually where a lot of success is found. And I think a lot of athletes they, in like motivational YouTube videos, there's quotes of like always be kind of sweating all the time and like be uncomfortable. But it, it is true because if you're uncomfortable, it probably means you're learning and developing versus being the person that has done collision cleanup for like 10 years in a row, right? <laughs> like, you know, I, I would rather uh, be uncomfortable and working on something that's kind of scary than being like a robot in my nine to five and just being bored. And, and that can lead to depression and burnout and just bad yeah. things. So I would say 
early on in my career, I would always attempt or ask for parts to the level that were a little bit scary and I didn't know if I could actually achieve them. Um, because I think, first off, you, ha you have the entire team backing you up, right? So it, even if you kind of like almost get there, there's going to be like a senior or someone else that can help you out and really push it to that, that final level of quality. So, yeah. and that's, that's not a bad thing, right? Like having to ask for help is never a bad thing. Yeah. I think I like, I, Lincoln's my art director. I'm a, like a level artist, lighting artist. And I go to Lincoln all the time for, for advice or how can I push this further? And he, he will tell me usually a lot of things that, oh, maybe fix this and this. And it's like things I didn't even think of. Yeah. Um, but like, I mean, I've at least made the attempt to push it at the yeah, beginning. And, right? and like, you know, like there's this whole like intimidation aspect behind like, oh, you're art director. Oh my God, the art director. Like, man, the art director feels the same way as you. <laughs> like everybody is use... quietly terrified. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I use Tim to, to help me when I feel uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't, right? I don't like, know we, if I'm making the right decision. Advice. Tim, I know Tim knows what he's talking about. Oh, like, dude, can you come over, help me? Like, it's always like that. Like back and forth. Oh, totally. Totally. Um, and you know, it, it's always going to be a back and forth no matter what. And that's like one of the best things about like a big studio because you know, There's you so have many people. endless resources, <laughs> yeah. endless like professionals that are like taught to like do that one thing that you're having trouble with and they, they have 10 years experience doing it. So like, there's nobody possibly better <laughs> to ask that one question that's really hampering you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that that is almost the benefit of sometimes biting off more than you can chew because oh, totally. it's going to force you to go find people to help give you solutions to your problems. Oh, yeah. And that's actually going to help you with, like, networking. You're probably going to meet people that you never would have talked yeah. to in the studio. That's, that's, like, a big aspect yeah. of plateauing, too, is, uh, you know, like, let's say you want to get that, like, promotion blah 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 right oh i want to move from junior to mid-level mid-level senior um you know there, there's like the whole social aspect of it as oh, well this is that's so like key. that's like huge yeah totally huge because like you know a, a lot of people they like you know they don't really think about that oh well I'm, I'm doing so good in my art but like i'm not really paying attention to you know social side of things you know like like becoming and I'm not saying suck up to uh, friends yeah, definitely, with definitely your lead artist up. or director. Like, just, you know, like, be be yourself. Be a cool guy. Like, hang out with the people there. Like, get along with them. Don't be a dick. Like, be nice. <laughs> that's, like, that's always a good piece of advice. Don't oh, be a dick. Totally. But like, no, like, uh, try, to, try to expand outwards. You know, like, uh, when you have those tough situations with people that are in positions of power or, you know, even if they're, like, a... a a junior like yeah, be as nice as you can like always be as professional as possible like be that cool guy that everybody wants to be you know like it and but be yourself yeah and be yourself 100 be yourself. yeah and that's like you know that's only going to elevate you and uh you know show everybody in your studio uh that you're basically ready for the next step of in your evolution from uh bulbasaur to uh ivasaur that's right. You got it right. I was going to say Venusaur. Oh, man. My Pokemon game's off. Oh, but uh, no, like, yeah, exactly. The nerd jokes. The nerd jokes. But yeah, basically, like, that kind of goes back to your comfort zone, right? Like, I know for me, I'm very an introverted person usually. And when I, especially when I first got into the industry, um, not only was I kind of afraid of big tasks, but also the group environment of the studio, integrating into the studio. But like almost like I talked about in the la in one of the last videos of the, the 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 mask of Zorro ring thing, right? Like start with what you're comfortable with, and then just progressively increase your comfort zone. And you're always going to be playing a little bit outside your comfort zone. Actually, uh, one thing I want to say on that is also be aware that you're not biting off more than you can chew, right? So like let's say, oh, I want to stay out of my comfort zone. I want to like learn about this and you know challenge myself. Okay don't take like this massive task that you know is going to be impossible in the deadline that you have. Like if, if you do happen to be in that situation, always tell your producer, tell somebody about it like immediately as soon yeah. as possible because you know, raise it, the flag. Yeah. Yeah. Raise the flag. If, if you don't raise the flag, like uh, if there's, that's almost anything, the worst thing you can yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. Like always raise the flag because somebody will be there and there will be like, resources thrown to fix the problem right away whereas if you don't say anything then you're the asshole that fucked up the deadline <laughs> so <laughs> that's a pretty harsh but yeah you can crash and burn it, it's better to 
to ask for help um, whenever you need it. And I think I think a lot of juniors they're really eager to learn anyways. So I mean, oh, yeah. um, so that's that's not usually the problem. But I think the the biggest thing is the fear of looking bad or like, oh shit, this deadline's coming up. I'm not gonna make it. But like if I ask, like I I told them it's gonna take me two weeks, <laughs> and I'm I have like an extra week of words of work coming up. Like yeah. what do I do? Absolutely, be like, hey, I thought I could get more done in this time period, but you know. And don't even be, feel the need to make excuses. Like, don't be like, oh, well, this happened and this happened in the software. Oh, yeah. Just be like, I thought it was going to take me two weeks, uh, but I think it's actually going to take it three weeks to get to the level of quality that's required. Yeah. Uh, can somebody help me on this or can I get an extension? Um, because that's going to show that, you know, you're mature enough to ask for advice it, it, or ask for it, help. It basically shows that you're a professional. Like yeah. you're no one, No one does it perfect the first time. Yeah, yeah. But like, you're also capable of like, realizing that you made a mistake and yeah. and rectifying it in terms of uh the overall production of the company so uh, that that actually shows a producer that like you're mature enough and you're professional enough yeah. to to be honest about uh your, thousand, your productivity a, a thousand as an percent. artist right so like don't be afraid of looking bad it, it's if you have to you know like raise the flag and say hey i need more time on something do it as early as possible because then it's easier to, to pivot and course correct rather than like two days before the deadline having to like hit the panic button. And I mean, I, I've done that in the past where I'm like, oh, this this piece, the level isn't getting done. Yeah. Uh, and they've like rapidly diverted to other artists to help me out. And I mean, that's, you know, if, if another artist has to jump onto your work, it's better for them to have a week to get into the groove of it and then they're gonna be yeah. a lot happier with you than oh like oh my god we're both staying here for 12 hours we're both fucked <laughs> <laughs> straight up no but like it's yeah don't be afraid of looking bad um but i would say the biggest thing is always play outside your comfort zone that's the biggest way to win yeah it, it's the fastest and easiest way to win but be careful with it don't kill yourself <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. yeah and i think i think judging what you can and can't do is uh something that comes with experience actually one more thing on that point is that uh i think everybody really underestimates uh what they're capable of learning and capable of achieving within a short amount of time like yeah um and you know a specific example of being in that situation of feeling uncomfortable me last year I gave a speech to, it was like 500 people in Mexico. They flew me down there. It I'll, was like, I'll this, link to that below in the description. It's really, really good as it, well. It was this like big thing. And, you know, I, I'd never done a big speech like that before. Like 500 people, you know, it, it was like mind blowing. You like get on the stage and you're like shitting your pants, you know, it, it was like a big deal. And uh, I don't know. It, it was like after, you know, I'd practiced it a lot. Uh, after like five, 10 minutes, you kind of, you get in the groove. Yeah, it, it just like it doesn't really matter anymore. And you know, even leading up to the speech, it's like three, four months before you're just stra you know, you got like sweat bullets going down your head, you're freaking out about it. But like it I don't know. It's like those those things that you think are just so big and so momentous yeah. and they can potentially ruin your career, like ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, it will not ruin your career. Like yeah. it, it will actually make your career way better. And even if you fail at it, it doesn't even matter because yeah. like you learned something from it and, and that's all Usually, that matters. Like the, you know? the failures are kind of like forgotten after time anyways, totally. but like the benefits of just stepping up and, and taking oh. action on something like will vastly outweigh and, any and, failures you've ever and, had. And like, I don't know, you, you tried, you, you like, you put yourself out on the, on the line and like sacrificed your, your mind and your body to, to get, <laughs> And the blood and sweat and tears, but like uh, you, you just you did everything that you could to to solidify uh, your life and your goals, and that's all that mattered. And you know you should really be proud of yourself for that. So it's yeah. a big win. Yeah. All right. So this next question is from uh, J Jacob Clausen uh, on Twitter. He says, "When it comes to becoming an art director, is there any skills that are good to pick up that's maybe not obvious?" Oh, that's a good one. Because you, you recently made the transition from like level artist, environment artist to art director, right? So what are some, maybe some skills that are more high level that uh, kind of apply to the art direction side of things that you didn't really have to think about 
on your day to day as a level artist? Like uh, the typical skills that you think of when you think of art director are uh, amazing artist style guides, always great at art direction. He's great at uh, giving feedback, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, people skills that you soft have to skills. have. Yeah. Soft skills are like huge with art direction. Like yeah. you need to be able to like tell somebody to redo that one thing that they just worked on for a week for the third time <laughs> and, you know, say it in such a way that isn't offensive to them. And, figuring out how that person works yeah 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 like you you need to have like a bit of a beat on like each specific person and and know how they work and what you know might might offend them uh or might make them feel good about what they're working on we've worked with people in the past that are super blue collar and other people that are kind of more on like the oh yeah sensitive side of things right like where it's like you have to be really kind of okay well this is good but maybe do it like this and other people are going to want you to be like this sucks, fix this right now. And they're going to be like, okay, I'm on it. Right. Yeah. Like judging people's personalities, I think is something that it takes a while to develop, even as like a more like a leadership role, more leadership skills, I think. Yeah. Right. I, I think like, uh, you know, I think patience is, is actually like probably yeah. like one of the key ones too. Like it's, you know, patient, it, you're sitting in meetings all day. Like, it, you know, you're, you're an artist. Like you want to work on stuff. Like, it, you know, artists aren't known for being patient. Yeah, like they just want to. Maybe ah, that, that's a big you know? thing too, right? It's like for you, I think, especially working on with you on a day to day basis. So I kind of got to see some of this transition in action. I would say I that saw some of the impatience. The, <laughs> the impatience, no, but like the the um, having to step back and be a little bit more hands off and and have uh, have yeah. faith in other people that they can get the job done. Yeah. When, when you're like, I could get this done myself in in like ten minutes. Yeah. Or I could, I could do this myself. Like, why don't I just get in there? But I, I think stepping back to have more of the macro view was something that like oh, yeah. a skill you really had to develop. Cause you're so used to as a level artist to be like, all oh, these rocks, I'll just go in there and move them. Oh yeah. Where you can, you know, be like, you fix these rocks and I have 10 other things of critique and feedback and, and style guides to make. Yeah. So you don't have as much hands on. Right. So I'd say that's like the most difficult yeah beco- becoming <laughs> to like, be honest less, like less uh precious about actually doing art well and more of like you're actually working for the team i would say yeah you're working yeah. for them they're not working for you because i think a lot of people get that twisted with leads and art directors is like they're my boss uh, i'm trying to please them but a really good leader is a hundred percent working you're doing everything you can to make them be- like their life easier you're providing the air cover of the yeah. politics and all the meetings you're in the meetings so they don't have to be, so they can be working on art, right? And you're just, you're basically making me feel like I have so much to work on <laughs> as an art director. No, I, like, I, I think you, you've really stepped hard into the role and, and, and started to do it well. But there, I mean, with any role transition, there is that learning yeah. point, right? So I think oh, totally. those are just my observations of, of your transition into that. And I think, was there some frustration for you at first? Well, there's Stepping some, away there's from some it a frustration bit. right now. You're <laughs> just, fired. Just, <laughs> <laughs> breaks the whiskey bottle over my head. But um, like, yeah, how, how was no, that there, transition? There's to like, you? there's definitely like frustrations. Like, uh, you know, it's like any like role transition that you're going to do is is going to be huge. Like, uh, you know, again, outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, you're you're just going to be thrust into this position of like, oh, okay, I'm doing this whole new thing. And I'm interacting with this whole new department of people. And, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, for me specifically, I'm in meetings, I'm, uh, you know, walking around the floor, I'm talking to people, I'm trying to see what they're working on. And, you know, like some, some people, you, you, you have to watch them, you have to make sure that they're working on what they're, they uh, like assigned to work on. Uh, some people are like, working way more on stuff that they're not supposed to work on, <laughs> you know, like, and it's but like, like hurting sheep a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It it's a little bit like that. But it, I mean, it's like I know for me, I get super distracted. Oh, and me like, too. I'll, I'll go off on crazy tangents of like, well, I'm just gonna fiddle with this lighting here for a bit, or I'm just gonna doodle with these materials. And it's like, I think it's your job to kind of be like, this is what we need to focus. Here's three things that we can focus on that are gonna have a bigger impact. Oh yeah. And you you've helped me with that yeah. a lot, right? Like in the past of like. I'm not, I'm just sitting there maybe just randomly doing level art and you're like, Oh no, like focus on like something like the silhouettes and the composition in this area. And it, yeah. it kind of like, you just lead me back in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's like, yeah. And it, that's like the hardest thing to do really is to like, fuck, I, I just want to like go into that area and like 
grab all the level art and move it around, you know, like, I don't want to have to like yeah. tell somebody to do it. Right. And that, and I don't know, it, it's tough to actually like, well, it's like rely on other people. Communication you know? skills. Yeah. Yeah, a exactly. Thousand percent. It's, so it's patience. Th- notice that almost all of these points aren't actually directly tied to art. It's like, it's more like the soft skills, communication skills, yeah. uh, patience, yeah. stuff like that. Because at, at the point of when you become an art director or an assistant art director, your art skills are already kind of in the bag, right? Like they're already proven. So like yeah. L- Link's good at, he's actually really good at 2D and 3D. Um, so he's very different than me. Like I've always been on the 3D side of things. Um, so I think you would definitely make uh, a stronger art director because you can, you have a more of a handhold on the overall artistic like uh, it's, tool set, right? It's, like it's basically just knowing like what looks good. Yeah. You know, and exactly. I, like, that I, doesn't really matter. 2D yeah. 3D. Yeah. It's not even like a question of, of 2d, 3d. Like, it, yeah, it, it's just a question of like good. knowing good composition, good lighting, good materials. Uh, but you know? I think before you even get considered to be an art director, you have to have shown mastery of those things anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then sure. it becomes, yeah, more exactly more of the soft skill side of things. So like patience, uh, going into meetings and knowing, when to speak up, when to stay quiet, <laughs> like a, a lot more of the, like the political and soft skill side of things is, is where I, you develop your skill set. I, I think like, uh, some of the best art directors and you know, I've, I've only been doing this for like six months. Like I'm not a, a master at, by any means of, of being a assistant art director, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, um, some of the best art directors that I've worked with are like, they're just nice. Like they're there, like they realize you're an artist. They realize that you, it's your baby, the thing that you're working on. Yeah. They're there with you. They're like, you know, they, they care about you. They're, they're trying to help you. They, they're like empathy. They're, they're guiding you, but like not in like a jerky fashion, in a slow fashion. Like yeah. just, Hey, come over here. Come look at this. Come look at this. A nice thousand, little being able to empathize with other people on the, yeah, on the mountainside. What's, what's going you know, on with like, their life? What's going on with their personality? And just empathizing with that and figuring out how to speak to that person, which is a skill oh, yeah. unto itself. Because, I mean, yeah. I've worked with people in the past that are, again, super blue collar and they might not actually make the best, uh, you know, do this, do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> get it right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, I mean, a thousand percent developing the soft skills is probably the biggest thing. And taking the step yeah. back to have the macro view. Oh, so yeah. If there's two points, like, Yeah. Yeah, so take it, learning those. to step back and be hands off and have faith in your team, which yeah. is what a good leader does anyways. And, and it empowers the team. You, you're totally, you'll go out of your way to teach people on the team new things or new skills, uh, even if it takes away from like your, your overall time, because in the long run, I think that really pays off, right? Yeah, yeah. It saves you time in the long run. It's they, like, know, they know how to do it themselves. It's also like, you know, creating that like time investment of like, okay, well... Like, okay, I know this person needs, it's like allotting all of the specific strengths and weaknesses of every single aspect of your team and, and knowing how to cater to each yeah. one of those. And then, uh, you know, being like, okay, this person needs to focus on this, or this person has a strength in this. And I'm going to, I'm going to like point them like the, the crossbow the and, and shoot nasty. them over there yeah. and get them to work on that. And you know, it's not just the art director that does that. It's the producer, it's the, the leads. It's, you know, it's everybody kind of plays a role in that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Deploying people against their strengths. Yeah, exactly. And that, and, and that that's comes down to spending time with them and developing those interpersonal relationships. Oh, totally. And totally. getting that one-on-one rapport, which I think is so, so important to develop like, even even if you're if you're a senior artist as well, like ment- like mentoring other artists, um, developing those that rapport and those personal relationships, it's gonna help you out in the long run because if they're not afraid to approach you, uh, like approaching people higher up the train can be so intimidating, right? If if you've already spent those hours like knowing how the, that person works, um, you're gonna have a lot better results out of them because you know how to work with them and again deploy them against their strengths and. And work with them in a way that you can get the, the most out of their skills and abilities and making them feel comfortable doing their job. Yeah, totally. Perfect. Wow. Hopefully you guys are getting a lot of value out of this Q&A session with Lincoln. Uh, that's the end of part one. We got part two coming out uh, tomorrow. So make sure you're subscribed with the notification bell turned on. That way it'll just naturally show right up in your YouTube feed. In part two, we're actually going to go over some tips for indie studio startups. 
uh, how to find an internship for students looking to break into the industry that way, uh, as well as we're going to touch on some career defining moments from the both of us that you can probably apply those lessons to your own journey into the industry. So before you go, don't forget to smash that like button uh, just to say thank you to Lincoln. Let us know down in the comments below what the heaviest hitting point was in this episode for you so far. And don't go anywhere because we got part two coming right up. As always, thank you for watching. See you in the next video.